Business is simple. It's just not easy. We focus on three things to help you run and grow your business more easily. Talent, sales, and how to scale. This is the Talent, Sales, and Scale Show. Brian Whittington with this episode of the Talent Sales and Scale Show. Today we have Liz Wendling joining with us and she is a multi-time author and she's really talking about how in the world do we sell without selling out our soul and she has a really unique perspective on this and today's topic is going to be how do you use power language and words that don't diminish your influence and impact? And I see it all the time, so I'm really excited about this. I think that's where most salespeople fall down. And let's take it even out of a sales perspective. That's where most people fall down on their interpersonal communication skills. So I'm really excited about this. So welcome to the show, Liz. Thank you, Brian. Good morning. Good morning. All right. Now, question number one. Why should we listen to you? Yeah, you wrote a couple of books, but so what? Why should we listen to you on this topic? <laughs> well, on this particular topic, when it comes to language and being able to communicate differently than the average person out there or the typical person out there, is, is when we change our language, we can change our results. And these days, I have noticed that people are sending emails that sound the same. They're leaving voicemails that sound the same. They're, they, they are blending into the sea of sameness with everyone else on the planet. And they're having a struggle getting their message through. They can't bust through the BS barrier. And while expertise and skills are essential in business, it's the personal communication. What you say gets to transmit your expertise and confidence to other people. And there are a hell of a lot of books out there on communication that tell people what to say and how to say it. But I tell people why it matters. That's where I'm different. I don't just tell you, say this, not that. I tell you why, what's underneath the surface, why it doesn't hit, hit the mark anymore, why it causes you to be deleted and ignored. There's a why behind what you're saying. So we're going to talk about some of those examples today. Interesting. So I would really look at this mostly from a conversation like this, interpersonal or over the telephone. But you're even suggesting that I'm going to be able to do this through email and social, through, te through text or, um, yeah, I'll just put it through some type of texting message. Yes, yes. Interesting. Go ahead, you, please. Remember the old saying that it, it's not what you say, it's how you say it? Yes. That's decades old, that saying. And when we did a lot of face-to-face -face communication where we got in our car and, and were in the presence of another human being, that made a lot of sense because they could read your body language. People can see and feel the inflection in what you're saying. But now we've resorted to much, much more email and texting and blogging and written communication where all of that is taken out, all of that other stuff is removed. So if all we have is what we say now and, and uh, on paper or in a text or in an email, then you better believe what you say and how you say it matters more today than ever before because we've taken out so much of the way we used to communicate. Interesting. Okay, so let's, you tell me which way, which path should we go? Because I was not expecting you to say this. I was expecting to say, hey, use power of words and how you say it is going to be right. So that you're throwing me off here. Oh, I'm all, I don't know what to do. So let's, how would we do that? I guess, let me come up first and then we'll dive down more deeply. Okay. How do, what type of words do we use that might be diminishing our presence or might be diminishing our impact how do we, what type of words is one and then how are we doing that okay well the some of the words i like to call them phrase grenades language landmines and word bombs and these this type of communication um for example let's use a, a phrase grenade that i see all the time and almost every piece of communication that i either read from someone else or when i start working with a client or a company i have them send me as much of their messaging as they can so that i can get a sense of their baseline where are they starting where are they missing the mark where are they giving away their power and I, I see it in this, I call them minimizers and it's a phrase grenade, but it's a minimizer. And they're words that make you sound like 
you're apologizing for being professional, for doing your job. It's where people give their power away. And this is the language that waters down the, the impact, dilutes the message, undermines effectiveness, and, and decreases credibility. And it sounds like this. Uh, I know you're busy, so I won't waste your time. I know you get a lot of emails, so I'll be brief. Uh, I know you have a lot going on. and I don't want to keep bothering you. I know your plate is full, so I'll get to the point. I know you're swamped, so I'll be quick. All the way to, excuse my persistence, sorry to interrupt you, I hate to keep bugging you, I only need a minute of your time, or any sad variation of of those kind of minimizers where you sound like you're apologizing for doing your job. You didn't do anything wrong, so you can stop apologizing today. None of those words do anything to increase your impact and credibility. They make you shrink down. When you think about saying, I'm sorry to bother you, I'll only need a minute, you actually put yourself in a shrinking down position and a one down position. And when you come across that way, it plants seeds of doubt in the mind of a potential client. And I tell people that you're training people to either ignore you or to treat you differently. Interesting, so let's let's unpack pack that a little bit because in reality, especially the target that I'm going after. If I'm going after a C-suite or an entrepreneur or somebody higher up or a stronger personality, when I'm using these, as you said, phrase grenades or minimizers, I get a loss of respect. And whether or not I'm gonna do business with you is gonna greatly depend on whether or not I believe you can solve my problem. And if you don't have the belief or you're not bringing the fact that you have confidence that your solution is gonna work for me and you think you're wasting your time or my time, why would I give you time? It's insane to me and I've seen it time and time and time again. So I love it. Now, curiosity, why in the world do you think we do that? Well, because a lot of times salespeople have that negative mindset of, oh, I don't want to be one of those pesky, pushy, annoying salespeople or professionals. And then they wind up telling themselves, I don't want to be that. So they create a language barrier that makes them feel good. See, all those examples I gave, they don't help the, the receiver. They only help the person who is sending it. You're, they only help you. They make you feel like you're being nice and being persistent. But really what you're doing is you're conveying, I don't think I'm worthy of this business on a very subtle level. But we have to remember, doesn't matter what you say. It's how it's landing too on someone else. So that is not landing in a confident and strong and powerful way. It's like throwing a feather at someone versus throwing a golf ball at someone. It's going to land a little differently. And you need a if, Thor hammer. Exactly. If you want to throw around a bunch of feathers and have your message just wither into the wind, then continue to use these minimizers and phrase grenades that do absolutely nothing to the impact of your message. Why would you give your power away right out of the gate when you can stand up strong and start communicating with someone Because we're all equal, no matter who you're communicating with. You could be C-suite or the president. If you, we're all equal. We're human beings coming together to be human beings. And if we communicate that way and really respect ourselves and respect that other person, and you're already wasting my time if you tell me, I know you're busy, so I don't want to waste your time. You've just done that. You've wasted (laughs) my time. Now get to the damn point. So they just, they don't help us anymore. And it doesn't help our community in our communication. Okay. So you said phrase grenades. The other one you said was language bomb. So what's the difference between a phrase grenade and a language bomb? Well, they're, they're kind of all the same, but some okay. of them land, uh, blow up. I, uh, some of them will actually blow up your communication, a bomb. I call those the bombs, which are, and if you want, we can go into more examples, but yeah, please. Uh, I love examples. Yeah. So those, those are the ones that, um, first of all, I see everyone, I, I, the, the one I'm thinking about is the F word. And, and again, I told you, I, li- I read emails, hundreds of emails a week to find out why people are missing the mark. And, and the F word I'm talking about is follow-up. And follow-up has some counterparts to that. And that's touching base, reaching out, and checking in. I bet every one of us has at least, I don't know, a dozen, maybe four dozen emails in our inbox right now with the words, hey, I'm just following up. Hey, I'm Dutch, just touching base, reaching out, and checking in. And this... 
common language word bomb is is very common. And, and sometimes what happens is when people follow up, they are either not following up enough or they follow up too much or they follow their follow up is done poorly. It's generically, it's annoyingly or not professionally. And using those words, now it's not that one word is going to change how people feel about you, but think about how many other people are using that same word. How do you bust through the follow-up annoying messages that are in people's inbox if you sound the same as everyone else? So we've been following up this way for decades. Yeah, yeah. decades. And this follow-up method is a little behind the times and it needs a little zhuzhing up and a little update yeah. <laughs> because if we keep using the same messages over and over, I'm just following up. Hey, I don't know if you got my last seven email messages. Hey, I'm just checking in one more time. Do you still want to do business with me? What happens is that language comes across a little needy, a little desperate. Hey, I don't know if you got my messages and, and you're giving your power away again. And, and they can sound very subtle, like, hey, Marie, I just wanted to follow up to see if you had any questions regarding the proposal I sent. Now, that's a pretty common sentence that people are sending. And first of all, you're sending me a follow-up message with no value in it whatsoever yeah. to find out if I had any questions about the proposal you sent. What do you think? I'm stupid. And I don't know that if I had questions, I can connect with you. So it's a failed attempt because it doesn't go anywhere. There's, there's nothing in the meat of that message that makes me realize, oh, I can get back to you. I didn't know that. I do have some questions. Yeah. So you're wasting a follow-up opportunity by saying, did you have any questions? I know that I could ask you questions. We're missing the mark here. We're not communicating at that higher level. Yeah, and the other thing, before you said follow-up or what, any of the other phrases that you said, you threw in the word just, and that is another way of minimizing. I'm just yep. doing this. I'm just, quit justing all over the place. For good I advice. know. I have to catch myself too saying that sometimes and it, it comes out and I think, oh my gosh, there it is again. And because I'm always listening with my third ear, yeah. <laughs> I say things as well. And I think, oh boy, I got to stop using that. Or that's a little bit, that may be, might be a little too overused and valueless. So I'm right. always catching myself as well. And, and that's the beauty of it, right? So even if you know this stuff, you're going to absolutely and accidentally screw up. But when you do, at least you can catch and go, let me rephrase that. When, what that's I meant right. to say, right? So we can do something about it. I love it. Okay. So there's phrase grenades, language bombs, and you gave one third one. What was the third one? You said it so fast. Oh, la phrase up. grenades. Uh, language landmines and word bombs. Okay. Do you have other, so language landmines? So we bombs can blow up on us, grenades can blow up on us, and like, what are what landmines do? Well, the same thing. You step on one of them, and you could lose a limb. <laughs> and I, I see so many people just trying to communicate in that way. And I do have one more, and that's the one where it, it feels like a landmine to me. And I just wrote an article on LinkedIn about it, and it's the L word. You want to take a guess what that one is? L word. Son of a gun. I, I, I'm i blanking here. Help me out. Okay. I would venture to guess oh, that. Wait, oh, wait. I got it. I love. Yes. I would love to. Yep. There are a lot of troublemaker words out there, but this one's a doozy. <laughs> and some people have lost hundreds, if not thousands of dollars this week just by participating in this one alone. The love fest. <laughs> People don't realize that using the love word, when you say, I would love, comes across as over ego, e eager, and here's the worst part, self-centered. Mm -hmm. Because when you tell someone what you would love to do to them, I would love to meet with you. I would love to drop, drop on a quick call. I'd love to discuss X, Y, Z with you, or I'd love to find out more about your business. I'd love to set up a 30 minute demo. Well, guess who that's about? Yep. That's all about you and what you would love to do to someone. It is not an invitation. So it comes across what I call super self-serving, needy, sometimes even too excited and a little desperate because it's all about you, right? Yep. And, and there are people out there that say, I don't want to be one of those self-serving salesy salespeople. I don't want to be like that. But every day they step on this landmine and come across self-serving and salesy when they use this language. Now I'm absolutely seeing why 
this is not just in in the language that we're using over voice, but absolutely over written text as yep. well. So I I'm I'm seeing this now. Okay. So we talked about what we shouldn't do. What should we be doing? What how <laughs> should we be saying this, right? Let's help so now that everybody's feeling badly, so don't feel too badly. We're just trying to help. We'd love for you to get better. Right. Absolutely. So right, um what should we be doing? So I call it the stop and swap. And whenever I'm working with clients, and like you said, this isn't an overnight thing. You will not stop doing this today and have a new language tomorrow. Absolutely not. But starting today, you can be aware, be the aware of what you're typing out, what you're, what kind of messages that you're texting or, or leaving for someone. And you, I, what I like, like to do is I tell people, script some things out. Instead of saying, I'd love to get together with you. I'd love to find out more about this. I'd love to set up a time. Write out a few phrases, and I'm going to help people with that. But write those out. Have those handy so that when you're ready to type, I would love, and come across with that self-serving energy, and you're going to replace it with something different. Because you have to remember, countless other people are sending emails and voicemails that sound like that, but they also sound like the world revolves around you when you do that. I right. would love this. I would love that. I would love it if you would spend some time with me or let me, I would love to pick your brain. Well, what about me? What about inviting me to a conversation? Instead of saying, I would love to do that. How about you say to me, how do you feel about getting together? Or how do you feel about getting a meeting on the calendar? What are your thoughts on finding a time that works for us to talk about X, Y, Z. That's an invitation. Whereas I would love is a, is a command and a demand. Make a request. So it lands lighter. It feels collaborative. It doesn't feel like you are coming at me. It feels like we're doing this together. Got it. Okay. Now let's, let's take a look at this. So the stop and swap, I'm going to do almost I've heard it in this way. I'm going to do an embedded, embedded command. Hey, let's do this. Might I make this suggestion, right? Something along those lines. Would that be an equivalent of a stop and swap or would that still be too strong in your mind? It's It, it could work. It, I would have to see the rest of the email, but it's still you making a, a little bit of a demand. I think we should do this. Okay. Um, Maybe how about we do this? Or what are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so, and I like that because because you're inviting them to be an active participant is really what I think what you're suggesting here, correct? Yep, that's exactly it. Okay, so we allow them to be an active participant and for them to think that they've come up with the idea. And, and yes. really Sherpa-ing or leading them down that path where you're the guide, but you have to really be that gentle guide because you can't shove. If you shove, they're going to push right back. That's And that's why emails and voicemails don't get returned. When you send an email that said, I would love to get on your calendar for 30 minutes, that's a shove. You are shoving someone and basically telling, something what, telling someone what works for you, but it wasn't an invitation. Give the other, the other person should have a say in this business communication. And I think you get farther down the pike and you don't have to send those self-serving follow-up messages that say, I'm not sure if you got my last 17 messages. If you communicate strong out of the gate and, and make it collaborative, you don't have to send those BS messages down the road. Yeah. And th that then you start sounding needy. Then you start sounding desperate. And then what happens is people blow you off or ghost you completely. And then what happens is I hear people... They'll blame the potential client. I can't believe they totally blew me off. I can't believe we had such a great meeting and I never heard from them again mm -hmm. because it's the energy you're showing up with that is making people lean back, not lean in. It's making them wonder, are you going to push me to make a decision when I'm not ready? Are you the kind of person that's going to put step on the gas or are you going to give me some breathing room to make a decision? That's what people are afraid of. Now, couple of things coming out of this you're one might say that you're fairly low energy just okay <laughs> right so you're high energy and you're saying hey let's be directive but inviting them in so directive but inviting them in right not being not being apologetic for saying hey i have something for you that i think will help 
how are you marrying that? Because you're super high energy. So if I'm high selling to a very technical type buyer, you might freak me out. So how are you adapting yourself to those those type of buyers and not being that stereotypical salesperson? In my writing, it would be different. I would be very direct in my writing. Shorter, more concise is better. But when I meet someone or I'm on a Zoom call or I'm, I'm on the phone with someone, I'm already picking up the energy. Plus, the way they respond to me in an email is another insight for me to be able to get a, get a feel for who they are. So I don't come to every sales call like I am on this meeting today. And, and I could moderate all of that and meet someone where they are, not where I want them to be. And a lot of times someone will say to me after a Zoom call, they'll go, wow, I, I, feel, I feel like I can go, go for, out for a run now. And I didn't intentionally want to bring them up from where they were, but I lowered myself down a little bit. And then they, they lifted themselves up and our energies were aligning with each other. We weren't clashing. So once again, it's not about you, right? Because I right. see so many times people, well, if they don't like it, so what? This is who I am. I have to be authentic. All right, fine. Well, then whenever you lose out on a lot of opportunities of helping others, that's yep. your fault. So you're, what you're suggesting, I hear this again. I saw a post the other day that people loathe the idea of a mirroring matching or they think, think it's manipulative. Right. Um, I forget the way uh, Jason Bay on his podcast, Jason Bay and Nick, uh, Capozzi, they, they, they did a podcast recently, um, and I forget the language, so forgive me guys that I can't remember it exactly, but instead of mirroring it, they called it, call it something else. That's kind of what you're talking about though, is right, feeding back the energy, feeding back the language, feeding back to that person the way that they would want to be communicated to, and if we do that, yay, we win. And Brian, the only way to get there, the absolute quickest path to getting there is to get out of your head and into your body and actually get a sense, feel the essence of the person that you're meeting with. You can't do that from your head. And too many people are stuck up in their head. What am I gonna say? How do I get the sale? I hope I do this. And they're, they're too busy thinking about themselves versus just relaxing into their body and, and syncing up and aligning with the other person, watch what happens when you take a few extra seconds to get there instead of being up here. It's a short journey from your head to your body, but many professionals don't wanna do that because they feel like they're gonna give up control when in fact, they, they're more in charge of what's actually happening if they get out of their head. All right. So now that seems like the the baton, the baton death march to be able to go from head to heart for a lot of people right or uh, I'm, I'm running the iron man triathlon to be able to get there walk us through there help help us out how do we do that well the what i always tell people is we're now in a really crowded marketplace there's no doubt about it and when you're in a crowded marketplace or an industry that's packed with the same kind of people that do what you do and you're seen as a commodity when you don't have an edge in what you do and you're seen as that commodity, then you have to have an edge in the way you engage and you consciously connect and communicate with people. You've got to create that edge because there are many ways that you can communicate and some of them may be working for you. And if that's working, don't change it. But you have to be able to do that, not only for yourself, for the other person. So it's pausing a little bit longer. It's saying to yourself, all right, I'm hopping on this Zoom call with this person. Getting a sense of who they are based on some of the communication you've already had with them. And hopefully it's not like a brand new communication. I'm not talking about that. Sometimes with a cold call, it's a little different. But if you've had some emails with, with that person or did a little bit of research before you hopped on the phone with someone, you get an essence of who they are and you have a nice starting point. But a lot of times people don't, they're, they're using it for their ego, not for the sales call. They're, they're about how can I make this better? How can I look good? Instead of how could we both look good? Yes, and it goes back to again. If you're the me monster, always looking inwardly, it's not going to be helpful. It's and I keep seeing this time and time again, and it's really been. I don't know. It, it seems like, and there's people out there that they believe they're the purple unicorn, right? How many times have you seen this, Liz? Where I'm different, right? I 
No, we're way. I don't. Who's your competitor? I don't have a competitor. Oh, BX, right? That's just, I sell to everyone. Everyone's my client. Yep. Yeah, or no one as good as me. They do something completely different. Not really. Right. Um, not really. I, and no matter how unique you believe you are, no matter how highly engineered, highly technical, highly differentiated your product is, they're going to bucket you. The way that we as humans understand things is we're going to bucket you into what we understand and therefore that's who you are and and if you don't learn how to differentiate and how to and it's not just the words we use right it's not the messaging of differentiating it's the differentiating of that trust building relationship i think yes. that's where the differentiation lies am i off on that idea no you're absolutely right well i do a lot of uh, virtual training with with clients and and when you get on imagine if you you were, I'll use my client, a, a divorce attorney. Let's say that I was a potential client and I was having a virtual consultation with three different divorce attorneys or bankruptcy attorneys. And I am talking to you one-on-one. -on -one, and then after our call, I'm meeting with another one and another one. And every one of them shows up and says, hi, good morning. Nice to meet you. Uh, what can I help you with today? Or, you know, I know a little bit about your situation. So tell me what's going on. And, and the next person says the same thing. And the next person says the same thing. How do you differentiate if, if you're all showing up and using the same approach, the same language, same words, how do you rise above that? And you do that by not doing what everyone else is doing, not just saying, hey, how are you this morning? How's the weather where you are? How was the traffic this morning if you're, if you're doing something in person? That doesn't bust through the noise barrier. So I teach my clients to... If, start with that human to human approach. And when you say to something, how are you doing today? Or how's things going? That is a very pretty generic way to start a conversation. Hey, how are things in your world? And I'm not saying you can't be that. Weave that in later on. Hey, by the way, how are things going in your world? I had a meeting yesterday with someone and he asked, actually asked that. He said, hey, Liz, before we hang up, I just want to know, how's, how's life going for you these days? Yeah. And he ended our call that way versus started our, our call that way, which I thought was really nice because he left me feeling as if that call, that was an important call to him. Like he wanted to, he really wanted to know that. So in reverse, I teach my clients to not get on and say, how are you? How's the weather? Is it, you know, any, any, uh, any trouble in your world? And, and, and say to someone, Oh, Brian, I'm so glad technology worked for us today. It's great when it happens for both parties and, and start the conversation like you a little bit different and a little more human and honest approach. Right. And, and then you can get into what I call, I'll call it an agenda setting statement, but it, it could be, it's everyone sounds differently. But if I said to you, if you came to me and I was a divorce attorney and I said, Hey, Brian, I know meetings like this can be kind of can be a little personal and I'm going to have to ask you a lot of questions before we get started. Are you in a place that's, that you can talk openly and freely with me? Are you comfortable? Like asking a question like that makes someone and, and really mean it when you ask it, I'm conveying that I really care about you. And for us to have a really good conversation, that's meaningful for both of us. I want you to be comfortable, but I can't know that unless I ask you that. Yeah, that's, and that's a great little takeaway there too, because if you say, hey, are you in a place where you can f speak freely? Because uh, that conveys, one, this isn't going to be your stereotypical salesy call. Yep. Two, we're going to ask some deep, hard-hitting questions. So you better buckle up. So whenever you're, whenever I ask you one, you're going to go, oh, yeah, that's they kind of pointed that out. So I really like that. That sets the stage nicely. So if you're talking to a C, uh, you know, the C level or any type of executive level, you know, hey, um, before we start, I want to make sure door closed, we can speak freely, and no, right? So stuff like that. Really, yes. Really subtle and, and Brian, what happens when, when you ask that question? The conversation takes a little hard right because someone will start letting you in on their world. Oh, I've got kids upstairs. If you hear any running around, it's going to be them. Or we're, we're sharing internet. So sometimes my, my, my uh, connection gets a little spotty. And oh, how many kids do you have? And it opens up this human to human. I'm a human, you're a human. Yes, we're going to get to business. But isn't it nice that we, we're, we're equal and we both have stuff going on? So we're, we're talking really then 
to go from head to heart that that triathlon using empathetic statements um I, I don't want to put words in your mouth but it's really being present active listening right nothing new under the sun right so why why is it that you, why do you believe that people don't do this i mean how many times ask open-ended questions be present be empathetic just have a conversation for goodness sakes we know this stuff so what do you think prevents people from getting out of their head into their heart and being present what what do you think that is oh it's probably a lot of things but it all depends on the mindset going into your day your the way that you function on a daily basis do you start out a meeting really well and then somebody throws you off your game and you unravel the, the rest of the meeting it's having body awareness. It's understanding, oh my gosh, boy, I, never, I haven't been asked that question before. I hope I don't lose it. It's being able to, to keep yourself intact and yeah. knowing that no matter what happens, it's trusting yourself enough to know that if you do get knocked off your game, you can say, you know what? I need, I need three seconds. Let me, you know, I just, I got to bring myself back. You can be human and actually say that instead of going up in your head and thinking, did I say that right? Oh my God, did I lose the sale? And, and before you know it, your presence is left the building and people feel that yeah. they can tell when you're no longer with them, you're only with yourself. Yeah. And it's subtle, but it's powerful. And people could see that. They could see it now, whether it's face-to-face -face or on a Zoom call. When you're disconnected, and I had this happen to me last week. I was on an uh, in intro call with someone, and she didn't shut her email off. And every time her email dinged, she looked up and, and broke eye contact with me. And I said something to her. I said, I don't know if you are doing this with your clients, but if you're doing that with your clients, that was very distracting. Yeah. And it made me feel like your email was more, way more important than me. And if you're talking to a potential client and you show them that, they're going to go to the next person. They're not going to hire you if you can't keep that eye contact going and saying, you're the most important person I'm ever going to talk to today, and you have my attention. And sometimes I'll tell someone to even acknowledge in the beginning of a meeting, hey, I want you to know all my technology is turned off. Everything we're talking about today, it's you and I. I am focused on you. Let that person know that I'm not going to be distracted, short of you know my, a ceiling fan falling on my head, but I'm all yours. That's that's a one acceptable excuse, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Got it. Okay. Now, do you have any recommendations to these folks then of how to, because really what you're talking about is confidence. Because if I don't have the self-confidence to go, I don't know. I have no idea how to answer that. I was not expecting that path. Yeah. If you don't have that self-confidence to be able to, to deliver that message, uh, any suggestion to them? Because I think Oof, that's, really that, that's where that all that internal work starts. Yeah. And it really has to, you've got to go within and ask yourself, why do I get stopped? Or what about me makes me think that I'm, that I can't be authentic in a conversation and say, you know what, that is a great question. No one's ever asked me that before. And I'm not, I don't even know that I want to take a stab at answering it mm -hmm. or or just being confident enough to call it out and 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 be authentic and human. So it, it's more of a deep dive into yourself and yeah. understanding where you get tripped up and why. Is it, does suddenly what happens in your mind, I'm not good enough, I shouldn't be here, I'm an imposter. Does that stuff start going in your head? Or no, I'm fully prepared. I know my stuff and nothing's going to knock me off my game. But if it does, I'm going to, I'm not going to get rattled. I'm going to get my shit back together and I'm going to get myself back on track. Now, what's your mindset before you start a call? What, uh, how do you prepare? Well, I always tell myself every phone call I make, every email I send, every voicemail I leave, I'm leaving it with, from my highest and best self. The person who I, I picture who I'm communicating with, even if it's only a LinkedIn photo or someone I had a Zoom call with, and I, I, I type the message that way, I hit send that way, and I know when I hit that send button, it wasn't me typing, uh, typing a text at a red light. I wrote it with intention. I wrote it with the right tone. I wrote it with the right words, and I hit the send knowing that 
It's going to land exactly how I wrote it. It's going to be received in that way. Not, hey, just wanted to follow up and make sure we're still on track. Are you still ready to hire me? No, there's going to be some more, a different tone, energy, and intention to it so that when it lands, that other person responds. And I have, I have it's rare that somebody blows me off or ghosts me. So rare. Yeah. because of the way that I write my messaging. It feels like it's written to someone, not at someone. To someone, not at someone. So that would be my takeaway is ask yourself, have I written this message to them or is it at them? There's a big difference. Interesting. So I, I will lay on the guilty sword on this one because oftentimes I'm moving too fast, too quickly and I shoot something off and I'll read that later. I'm like, son of a gun, that that is not good. Yeah. And you brought it up three, four, five times in that little, little, um, that little dialogue. There is intentionality. Listen, it doesn't matter how you feel. We have to be intentional, and it's just you get to choose, right? We get to choose how we react to something. So you might as well choose the right path yes. instead of falling victim to, oh, they made me upset, or no, they didn't. You allowed yourself to get upset. Right. There's if you take that ownership of it, you're so much better off. So. And today, Brian, it's not about you're wrong. I'm right. Or this is wrong. And this is right. It's really more today about what's effective. Mm -hmm. If if we're using language that diminishes our power, why keep using it? It's not that that's wrong. Go ahead and say, I'm sorry to bother you. I know you're busy. I won't waste your time. Go ahead. Use that language. If you want to keep doing that, I'm not telling you to stop. But for people out there who say, you know what? She's right. I don't like how I feel when I type that. I don't want to talk like that anymore. What's more effective? Think of it that way. Not that that's wrong, and but what's effective? What's going to grab someone's attention so that I can get that response? Because if you can't get someone's attention, you'll never get their business. And if you talk like that, you'll never get their attention. Yeah, I love that, right? To, consequences to everything. You yes. choose your consequences. And those consequences are going to be a direct result of your behavior or actions. So wholly agree with that. Now, what would you say to the people that are – you know, so I come out of the Sandler methodology or Chris mm -hmm. Voss methodology, right? Where if I if I'm using trust statements, where I'm minimize, minimizing something like, hey, would you be terribly opposed or completely opposed, or hey, I'm guessing you wouldn't in that negative approach in Sandler or a label in Chris Voss vernacular, whatever you call it, how would you align that with one of these phrase grenades, language bombs, or, or uh, landmines? Ooh, that's a good question. So give me an example of one that we might be able to turn around or. Yeah, like... sure. So, um, hey, my, my guess is you're completely, uh, um, my sense is you're hundred percent opposed to, to learning a little bit more about this. I wouldn't change anything on in that. Okay. If you're talking, yeah. If you're talking to someone, I think that that still works. Yeah. Cause okay. you're not diminishing yourself. You're just, you're, it's almost like you're, you're being more curious. Uh, okay, so help me unpack that because I was not expecting you, you to say that. So I'm super excited that you did. Yeah, I do. I like that a lot because, well, what it does is it, and it, it, it's an invitation as well. There's another form of an invitation in there. Well, I'm not completely opposed or, you know what? You're right. I, I this It's not for me. And you, you invite the truth. That's I it. want words, language, expressions to invite the truth. I want people to be invited to telling me what they really feel. Hey, Liz, this is great, but I'm going to need another couple of weeks on this. I'm heading out of town. I want someone to be able to communicate as effectively as I'm communicating with them. I want that back. And boy, is it beautiful when the way you're communicating with someone actually comes back to you, then you know it's a win-win situation. I want the truth. I would rather that. Yeah, and that's precisely why I use that language. And you have to be careful, though, because if you use it too often or Agreed. as a weapon or a bludgeoning tool, it just comes across as horrible. So, okay, You're great. Right. So really what we're looking then is inviting them into a trusted environment where they can feel safe and having clear dialogue where truth gets unpacked to ultimately solve a problem. I and mean, that's really what we're talking about. That's here. exactly it. And and I always tell people changing one or two words is never going to completely change 
your bottom line. What changes the bottom line is when you start looking at the words that you're using. Do they have the right tone, intention? Is it going to land? You're asking yourself a lot of questions. And let's say you're sending one paragraph to someone. Is that email written with the right tone, intention, and energy, and, and asking yourself how it's going to land? It's the thread of the whole email, not just taking out the love word. It's right. the, the whole messaging. So when I'm working with someone, we're looking at the messaging as a whole, not just one or two words. How do we add more strength, add more power, so that you get the response? So I, I, I use the analogy of a tennis match. When you have great communication, you lob it over the net and it comes back to you versus sending messages that keep hitting the net and you have to send another one and another one and another one. But if you hit a good tennis ball over the net with the right language, it will come back to you. So if you can create that beautiful volley, then the dialogue, the, the momentum of the dialogue you've started with a potential client stays at a different level versus falls flat and sometimes stops altogether. Yeah. And then you have to send that message. I don't know if you're still interested. I wanted to give it one more try. Are you still ready to work with me? And that neediness comes across. Correct. So uh, an alternative to that, do you have um, an alternative to that? Uh, I think you gave a little bit earlier. Well, how would you do an alternative to that? Instead of, hey, you know, I followed up all of these different times. What would you tell that person to do? I would leave that crap out, first of all. That would be my first thing. To leave the crap, <laughs> it, it is absolutely useless. <laughs> it's like uh, uh, like extra calories. It's like, you don't need them. They're, they're not going, they're just, they're useless. They're empty calories with no nutritional value. Empty language doesn't work. I would get right to the meat of the message and say, hey, Bob, we, the last time we spoke or we, the, when we spoke in last July or July 2020, you and I talked about, take me back to the scene of the, our last conversation. I call that the rewind technique. Okay. Take me back. Help re me remember. That's because, look, we are being pulled in so many different directions now. Take me back and say, hey, Brian, when we talked a couple of months ago, you and I had discussed the opportunity to, or you wanted to do X, Y, and Z. Yep. I don't know if that is still on your radar, dropped in priority, but if that is still something you want to continue a conversation around, let's get something on the calendar. How do you feel about getting another meeting on the calendar? Let's sort things through. And yeah. if at the very least, you'll, you'll know what to do next or, or something like that, that has some juice and some meat and some energy in it versus the flat messages of, hey, I know I just want to follow up one last time and then I'll leave you alone. Yeah, or the breakup, or the breakup email that nobody cares. Thank you. I'll close that. your file. I'm going to yeah. close your file email. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. know you know that one. It's like, go ahead and close my damn file, you fool. <laughs> yeah, <please. laughs> and and remember, we get we get what we give. So if our communication a lot in the beginning is weak and wishy washy, we're going to get weak and wishy washy back. Yeah. But I, so I teach that when you leave a meeting. When you're on a call like this, let's say you and I are talking about business in the future, but we're not ready to make a decision today. Right. And there's something else left for us to finish. Now, yes, someone will say, let's get a calendar, let's get another meeting on the calendar right now. I even go beyond that. That's a little 1990s. Yes, you want to have a, something set up. But when you say, hey, Brian, I know you and I are, we're parting ways and you've got some things to figure out, or I have some things I need to do. I've got some partners to talk to. How would you, and uh, how would you suggest I stay in touch with you? How would you like me to communicate moving forward? Yeah. Last thing I want to do is bloat your inbox, send you follow-up messages that have no value. I want to make sure that our communication keeps the momentum going. How would you like me to do that? What do you suggest? Now, Brian, you're going to tell me, you know what, Liz, why don't we touch base or, and you might use the word touch base. And I always let my, let potential clients use that. It's okay. Cause they're feeding you information. Yep. Why don't we touch base in three weeks? Great. Brian, you, would you want me to put that on my calendar and I'll, I'll reconnect with you. Do you want to get back to me? Now we've got this verbal exchange going where you and I are still equal. Versus saying, okay, well, I'll put it on my calendar and my tickler file and I'll get back to you. No, you're saying, how would you like this exchange to keep going? I want to honor you and I don't want to bloat your inbox. And I want to respect your time and mine. 
and if they find it valuable, they're going to they're just going to schedule that. And if they're unwilling to schedule that or have that dialogue, then guess what? You have your answer. So stop you do. Your time. You do. Boy. And it's and there's that truth again. I'm looking for the truth. I'm finding the truth in every one of our conversations. And if someone's like, well, I don't really know. Why don't I get back to you? And I, I give them the grace and I let them do that. I do not. I do not want to force someone to have a conversation with me if they're ready and I might reconnect with them. And if nothing happens, I might say, you know what, would it be okay if down the road, I reconnect with you and see if you want to pick up the conversation. They always say yes, but I leave it on that lighter note and you know, some will and some won't, that's it. Move yeah, on. hundred yeah, percent. <laughs> right. And then the, I would say the confidence to be able to do that is directly proportional to your prospecting habits. <laughs> Absolutely. Right? Full so, pipe. There's a different language when you have a full pipeline, right? If you're super Very busy, different. Yeah. If you're super busy, I don't care about that one. If you have nothing and you're going to starve to death. Oh my gosh, please. Right. It, so yes, you nailed it. Yep. Yeah. And there's something very a powerful and a confidence builder in being able to say, you know what? It, it sounds like right now timing is off why don't we do this? Or how do you feel about this? Yep. And let them say, no, 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 no. The time, the timing is right. It's just that I have this, this, and this to do. And, and then before you know it, another truth arises and how beautiful to get the truth of every situation you're in versus being dragging someone through your sales process. That's no fun. That's there's so much energy that you waste versus being efficient right out of the gate. 100%. So, all right, son of a gun, we're winding down out of time here. So let's 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 go along here. So one of your biggest uh, challenges that you see other people making whenever they're using these diminishing words that, that are negatively impacting influence. So one challenge that you've seen that we can avoid so we don't do that anymore? I, I would have them be a little more aware, just aware of the language that the, the typical language that you go to write in every time you open up an email. And mo a lot of times they, they sound like, Hey, how are you? Hope you had a great weekend. Hope all is well. I hope this email finds you well. Well, guess what? Spam messages start out that way. Correct. Why would you want to put yourself in a spam category? Leave that out. It doesn't matter. Now I'm not saying don't be nice. I'm not saying you can't be kind. But I am saying, put that at the end of the uh, at the end of the email. P.S. I hope you got had a great weekend. So I would say re-engineer your email so the meat of the message, the power's in the front, because that's the only way you're going to bust through the B.S. and the noise. Yeah, people are busy. Yes. Right. Three seconds. Just, yeah. Three seconds to the delete button. Why waste it on? Hope you had a great weekend. I hope this email finds you well. Now, if you don't know me and you're communicating that way, I don't believe you. I don't right. believe that you hope that I had a great weekend. I don't believe that for one second. Even if you do, it comes across cheesy. Yeah. So let's take that out and communicate yeah. from, think of communicating from a different level because that whole, that different level is going to get the attention of someone versus right. being in the, you know, the sea of sameness. Love it. Okay. And then uh, best business hack, whether around talent, how to hire sales or how to hire sales effectiveness or scaling of a business, one, one talent or, or one business hack that you might have. I would tell people to look at the last 21 emails they sent. Not 22, Ask, not 20, 22. 22. <laughs> and just dig in there and say, oh my gosh, they all sound the same. No wonder why that person didn't get back to me. Just go, just, I use the word, assess. <laughs> go in and assess. Is it, an, is it strong enough? Does it sound like me? Does it have enough energy and meat on the bones to get someone to respond back to me? If it doesn't, start from scratch. Right. Love it. Okay. So go back, check out your last 21, and then resources that you might recommend other than yours, and we'll come to that in a second, books, podcasts, guides. How can we learn this stuff? How, do, how can we learn to uh, communicate more effectively and powerfully? Uh, I am on a roll with someone called Peter Crone, and he's- I've not heard of him. Well, and, and he calls himself the mind architect. Okay. And it's just that. It's all the BS that's in your head that gets in the way of being fully expressed, being fully alive. And- all that mental chatter that shows up on our sales calls, shows up in our emails and, and, and getting rid of all of that and coming from a completely different place. So first you have to dismantle that and dissolve all the stuff that's in the way. And when you dissolve something and there's nothing there, then you get to recreate something different.
Love it. Yeah, and it's what we say to ourselves is insane. Uh, it's, it's just it's it's almost criminal. Okay, I love is. that one. So, uh, how do you uh, spell his name? C R O N E. Peter C Crone. Okay, just like it sounds. All right, yep. awesome. Um, so, what are the future trends that you're seeing coming down the pike? What are, what are you preparing for? Or what are you watching out for? Well, I'm watching it. I, I, let me preface this by saying when everybody else zigs, I typically zag because that just means everybody's on that same same path. They're going down that same path. I don't want to be a part of that. But I, I, I am seeing a lot of video in, in emails, video mm -hmm. email. And I think it works not right out of the gate, not as a cold call. As you get to know someone, I think video can be a great way to reconnect with someone. For mm -hmm. example, I was on a podcast like this and I had a conversation with a woman who called me after it. And then about two weeks later, she sent me the sweetest video. And, and she said, I can't stop thinking about our conversation. It was just so lively and vibrant. And I think I'm ready to hire you. Can we have a conversation? Oh, great. And she did that inviting me. And so yeah. she took my advice and she said, I am inviting. I'm not commanding you. She didn't say, I would love to sit down and talk to you. She said, she invited me to a conversation and I just thought that was beautiful. So I think it in, in the right place, video messaging could work. Nice. Love it. Okay. Well, so who should reach out to you? How should they do it, Liz? And why should people reach out to you? People who know they've got a language problem and they need to clean up, clean up their language and just someone who's struggling to get to bust through the noise in their prospecting messages or to get to decision makers. And they, they want to, challenge their current uh, prospecting that they're doing right now and they want to elevate it a little bit so they can get through and they're ready to do the work to get in and dive in and, and change some of the language and be committed to speaking a different language from that day forward and not going back to the crap that they were doing that doesn't work anymore. And and it's funny when you, it, it's like, you, know, you start going to the gym and you start seeing muscles. You don't go back to picking up a two pound dumbbell when you're, when you've been doing 10 pounds, you never want to go back to, to reverting back to old behaviors. Yeah. You're at a different level. You're ready for the 10 pound dumbbells. Let's do it. Somebody willing to do some heavy lifting, but the rewards are amazing. Got it. So buddy, somebody who's identified that they need to change and are willing to do it. Yeah, and tired of the results they're getting. If they're just ba banging their head against the wall and saying, I know I could be doing something different, I'm your gal. Got it. And how should they reach out to you? Oh, LinkedIn is great. Or right through my uh, website is Liz, uh, LizWendling.com or my email is Liz at LizWendling.com. Shoot me an email. Spell that last name for us, would you? W-E-N-D-L-I-N-G. So Liz Wendling, check her out. So Hey, this has been a lot of fun, a lot of energy, learned a lot of stuff. Don't go out and uh, do the, the phrase grenades, land language bombs, and land mines. Don't be throwing out your love and your follow-up, your F-bombs, and, and, and don't be minimalizing. Just stop, would you? All right. Stop. Stop and swap. F-bomb. Right. Hey, I really appreciate it. Uh, take this. A lot of application here. Really appreciate it, Liz. Get after it. Have some fun. On behalf of Liz Wendling, signing off. See you. Thank you.